So the last number of um, weeks, we've been going through the book of Nehemiah together and, and uh, just seeing a lot of similarities uh, between the people of God who are on mission from God, um, much like we who are on mission from God as well. And we saw that this group of people, Nehemiah specifically, as he kind of spearheaded that group, he gets the mission from the Lord uh, to go and rebuild the walls in Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem lay waste at this point. For 150 years, the walls had tumbled down, the gates had been burned, and the people uh, were devastated. Those walls and gates were a reflection of the strength or lack thereof of the people. And and Nehemiah, out of love for God and commitment to the people of God, takes the call from the Lord to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And as we saw in in the last number of weeks, we saw that every time they would make an advance towards their mission, they were introduced with some kind of opposition, something that would try to hinder them from doing what God had called them to do. And we recognize that really they're not much different than we are, are they? Have you noticed in your own life that every time you've kind of crossed the line and stepped out in faith and said, you know, today I'm going to turn over a new leaf. Today I'm going to get a fresh start. Today I'm going to do different than I had done yesterday. Today I'm going forward. And the first thing that's introduced into your life is opposition. Has that been your reality as well? I want you to know there's good news behind that because every time that the that that you are uh, intro- every time opposition is introduced into your life, it's because you're doing something from God, and the enemy isn't happy about it. And the the great news is he can't stop what God is doing in your life. He that began a good work in you, he's going to complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And so God allows opposition into our life to strengthen us to encourage us to hold tightly to him and lean upon him to accomplish great things for God. And as as we've been going through this book, we've seen the the kind of opposition that they have been experiencing. Much of the opposition uh, that we saw, they were were accusing them of, of having wrong motives and wanting to rebuild the wall. They're accusing the people of God of saying, you know what, it isn't really about Jerusalem. Nehemiah, you're just hoping to, to get enough popularity and enough strength to perhaps overrun the king. And your goal is to be the king one day. And so they start questioning his motives. They start questioning the, 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 their, the Jews' ability to accomplish the task that God had placed on them. How many times when you step out, people will so quickly let you know, you know what, I don't think you could pull that off. You don't have the right tools in the belt to do this. Opposition very quickly is introduced just like we saw taking place in their life, and yet we see them continuing to build anyway. And so we saw, where we left off in chapter four, we saw several um, attacks, several kinds of opposition that was introduced into their life. And yet, despite that, we saw in verse 6, Nehemiah says, in verse 6 it says, and so we built the wall. I love that. All this stuff, all the questions, all the accusations, and their response was, yeah, so we built the wall anyway. I love that. We're going ahead anyway, right? So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height. Why? For the people had a mind to work. I love the choice of wording that the Holy Spirit breathed into this text. The people had a mind to work. As we have seen, as we've been going through this passage of Scripture, we have seen that the assault that was being presented to the people of God was not a physical assault. It was an assault on their minds. It was to try and get them to change their way of thinking, to get them to try and question their ability, to question God's ability to work through them. And so as all the the assaults were launched and the opposition was introduced and the the fear was tried, they, they tried to instill fear in them, their minds were protected. And it says, and the people had a mind to work. The assault didn't find a place in their mind and they continued to work anyway. I love that because it just reminds me of me. It reminds me of the way in which the enemy tries to mess up with my mind. 
He tries to instill some stinking thinking in my mind that prohibits me from doing what God has called me to do. Does he do that with you as well? Right? Doesn't he love to bring up accusations from the past? Doesn't he love to bring to the surface insecurities that you have nursed all of your life and you look and think, there's, Hi, there's no way I could possibly do that. He tries to get into our mind and change our way of thinking. And the example we see in the people of God is despite that, they had a mind work. Their mind was guarded and they continued to do what God had called them to do. And so it's there that we pick up this morning, and uh, we pick up right where we left off. The, the assault um, continues, right? Um, right after, he says, so we built the wall, and the people had a mind to work, and then at, like we saw every other time, after every success comes opposition, right? We, I said the most vulnerable time in our Christian journey is right after our most recent, what? Our most recent win. It's then that the enemy tries to introduce challenge, right? And so they just had a win, and now we recognize that there's more opposition that's about to be introduced. Interestingly, up until this point, the opposition that was being introduced to them was coming primarily from two people, one in particular, Sanballat, who was the governor of Samaria, and another guy by the name of Tobiah, who was an Ammonite. And they were, the, they were kind of working together to try to discourage and hinder the wall from going forward. But, but these two dudes, they weren't able to get the, the work to stop. And so what they did is they started to recruit some other people to try and hinder the work from going forward. And it's there that we, that we pick up as this crowd of dissenters begins to grow. Look with me at verse 7 of chapter 4. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and cause confusion in it. Very interesting. Their goal was to come and fight against Jerusalem and cause confusion in it. I love what we see taking place here. Up until this point, as I said, it's Sanballat and it's Tobiah, and they are trying to hinder what God is calling them to do, and they are unsuccessful in stopping the wall from going forward. And so they recruit people who will agree with them that this wall should not be built. They find people who, are, who will agree with them that the Jews are in the way. We don't want them to emerge into being a, a strength again. And what's interesting is we see they bring in the, the Samaritans and, and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites and, and the Termites, and they're all, are all together, and they're all united together. There's really no Termites there. There might have been, but there wasn't. A, maybe that's why the walls went down. I don't know. But... <laughs> But they're all united together. What's interesting is, if you do a little research, you find that the Arabs and the Samaritans and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites, they never got along up until this point. But they joined forces together to stop what God was doing. Have you ever found that people who you didn't even realize they got along together, when they find a common cause to try and stop what God is, God is doing, they can, they can find some unity even amongst themselves. And what's interesting is if you were to put um, Jerusalem on a map and you'd look and see where the Ammonites were and where the Samaritans are and where the Arabs were, you'd find that these, these other people groups, they surrounded Jerusalem. They were, they were to the east and the south and the west of them. Imagine what that must have been like. I mean, sometimes we can, we can kind of divorce ourselves from um, the, the, the reality that these are people just like you and I. Sometimes we think that the Bible characters weren't human like we were. I mean, we know they were, but we fail to remember sometimes they felt like we feel. They hurt like we hurt. They get scared like we got scared. And I'm sure for these people, even though they knew God was at work, I'm sure they started seeing the opposition was beginning to grow and was starting to surround them. And now the people from our east and the west and the south, they are surrounding us. They are, we are not in Kansas anymore, Toto. We are in a very scary place where people are surrounding us. You ever felt surrounded 
by those who were opposing what you were looking to do? Maybe you, maybe you kind of crossed the line at one point in your spiritual journey and said, you know what? I'm going to live out this thing called Christianity. I'm going to honor God with my life. I'm going to move forward. And you found yourself with opposition that was being introduced into your life. And if it wasn't people, sometimes it's what? It's circumstances. Circumstances can present themselves to try to hinder what is going on. And what I find very interesting is that that's exactly what's kind of taking place with the people at at this point. They're being surrounded by people who used to be enemies, but now they are working together against one enemy, the people of God, and they are trying to put to a halt what God had called them to do. It's interesting, the amount of times where I have found that people who didn't even know each other can gather around a a cause that is against what God is doing, and they can find tremendous unity in that, and they can become the closest of people. Have you have you have you noticed that? I I, I have found in my years of, of being a pastor that, that I can find one person who sits on one side of the room who has a gripe about something. And they'll find that if there's one other person in the church with the same gripe on the other side of the room, within, within an hour, they'll be having coffee together. They just gotta find each other, you know? How does that happen? Well, we, we, it's kind of like what I mentioned out a couple of weeks ago. We, Paul says this, Paul said, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and, and rulers of this dark age. In other words, not everything that's going on is a result of what's happening in the natural. A lot of times we are, a lot of times the opposition that we are confronted with is not introduced into our life from natural sources, from people. Paul says, we don't wrestle against those things. We wrestle against something that is supernatural. We wrestle against something that's in the spiritual. As I highlighted a couple weeks ago, the enemy has a way of whispering into the ear of those people who are against God. And, and so, we, so what we see taking place in this new united front against the people of God is a tremendous unity that's taking place as they are working together against what God is doing. And what's interesting is, is, is these are the people who they are surrounded by them. It reminds me of Exodus chapter 14 where Children of Israel, they're just, they're exiting out. That's where we get Exodus, right? They're, they're exiting out of, of Egypt. They're heading to where God is looking to bring them. They're going to the promised land. They're looking to move from where they were to where God wanted them to be. In Exodus chapter 14, we have a beautiful picture. Behind the people of God are the Egyptians, and they are chasing them. Because those who keep you in bondage don't want to let you go. Right? And so they are being pursued by the Egyptians behind them. They have the mountains on the side of them. There is really only direct one direction for them to go. And so they are in hot pursuit from the Egyptians and they are moving forward to what God has them to do. And as they are moving forward, they are confronted with yet another opposition. They can't go to the left, they can't go to the right. And so they keep going forward and they come in contact with what? The Red Sea. Just when, it doesn't seem, just when it seems like it can't get any worse, they are now surrounded on all four sides. And maybe you're here this morning and you can say, I've been there. I know exactly. I feel sometimes like everywhere I look, I am confronted with opposition, conflict, people, circumstances, whatever it may be. And you start to feel like, how in the world am I ever going to fulfill God's purpose for my life when I'm constantly surrounded by opposition? But what did God do with the children of Israel when confronted with opposition that they weren't capable of dealing with? The scripture says God opened up the Red Sea. He parted the water and the people of God passed through on dry ground. 
And I want you to know this morning that if you're in that place where you feel like you're just, you're just surrounded by conflict, you're surrounded by opposition, you're surrounded by those things that are telling you that you can't, I want, to, I want to tell you this morning, yes, you can. God, if he has to part the Red Sea for you, he's going to accomplish what he has, he has purposed in your life. Don't get discouraged. Have a mind to work. Have a mind that says, you know what, God, you are bigger than anything I'm facing, and God will bring you through to the other side. He did it for them, and it's contained in the pages of this book, not just as a history lesson, but it's a reality for our every day because God continues to deliver his people. And we see God delivering them. And so here is Nehemiah and the people of God. They are surrounded. And look what happens in verse eight. And it says, they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. Who plotted? They all plotted together. They. I don't know about you, Andy, I can't stand they. They always have something to say. They seem to know a whole bunch about, they think they do, a whole bunch about everything. And the reality is they might know very little about a whole lot of things, just enough to be dangerous. They aren't really concerned about your well-being. They aren't dreaming with you to see you fulfill God's purposes and plans for your life. They, are, they have a plan of God, a plan for your own life. They are the ones who will discourage and bring, and bring the worst out of you. Have you been introduced to they in your life? I wonder if faces are popping up in your mind as I'm talking about they. They have always got something to say for you and what you need to do and how you need to change things and how you need to move forward. They always have something to say. And I found something. They aren't an only child. They have a brother. And their, their brother's name is everyone. <laughs> right? They, they it kind of looks like this. You know, you know, everyone is feeling like you shouldn't be going forward in, life, in doing this. Everyone feels like you, you, you need to introduce these changes into your life. Everyone, and it's interesting if you start to really pay, unpack a little bit. So tell me, who is everyone? Give me names. Usually it's about two people with the gift of tongues and not the right kind of tongues. They just love to, they just love to talk. And they have another, they have a cousin. And the cousin's name is nobody. Nobody thinks you have the tools to accomplish this. Nobody thinks that, that, you, that God, that, that God is, is for you. And those, those people, they whisper in your ears, and sometimes they really aren't physical people. They are sometimes lies that you held on to in your past. Maybe they are insecurities that you've nursed all of your life that continue to, to whisper into your ear as you go about your journey, and you recognize that, man, these are the things that continue to hold me back. They always have something to say. And it says here, they all plotted together. It sounds like such a unified front. And what was the goal? To fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. The only way to stop a people who have a mind to work is to try to confuse their thinking, to confuse their mind. The goal of the enemy there, they recognize the only way we could possibly stop this forward progress, the only way we could stop the momentum, the only way we can change them from having a mind to work is to bring confusion into the equation. And you know what? The enemy there is no different than the enemy around you. He still operates in the arena of confusion. He always tries to get you to second guess everything you do, what you believe, how you feel, what you've experienced. He's always trying to bring about confusion. 
You ever have those moments where you have just a barrage of thoughts, one after another after another? You think, where in the world is this coming? I can't get my bearings. Listen, brother, sister, you're under a spiritual attack, and the enemy's trying to come in and sow confusion into your mind. That's how he operates. They plotted together. The result of putting too much stock in what they have to say is confusion. Their goal was to bring about confusion. And the moment we give too much attention to what they have to say, their mission will become accomplished and confusion will find its place in your mind. Don't put too much, listen, let me just also say, they, don't have your best interest in mind. But some people do. Don't remove every bit of info, every every bit of advice. When you've got some people who've earned the right to lovingly speak into your life and, and, and have proven that they truly do have your best interest in mind, you would do well to listen. But I don't know about you, but I've come to realize not everybody does. And so we need to know when to take they and put them on the shelf. Here's my point. The more you listen to they and everyone and nobody, the less you'll be led by the supreme one. The less you'll be led by the supreme one. The more you let they speak into your life, the less you'll be able to be led by the one who wants to lead you. And you see, God will allow those things to come into our life so that we would learn how to hear his voice. So we would learn how to tune out dissenting voices. And so we, might, we may follow the Lord's voice. Jesus said, my sheep, they know my voice. And in a, in a time where if you, you're no different than I am, there's voices coming from every direction, right? And I don't mean in a, in a psychological way. <laughs> Everybody's got something to say. My sheep, Jesus said, they hear my voice and they listen. That's exactly what they did. They try to come in and sow confusion. That was the assault. And they weren't having it. Nehemiah and the people, they, they didn't allow it to land. Instead of engaging in with the naysayers, they engage with the one who sent them on mission in the first place. Look with me in verse nine. Look at their response to the naysayers. And we prayed to our God and we set a guard as a protection against them day and night. When the naysayers came knocking on the door, when the naysayers came to prohibit what they were going to do, when the naysayers came to stop the forward momentum, their response was not to the naysayers, but they went directly to God in prayer. As we've been going through this study these last number of weeks, we have seen this has been the pattern for Nehemiah all throughout, that before he opened his mouth, before he moved forward, he went to the Lord first in prayer. Why do we do that? Why do we go to God? Why do we not just employ our own intelligence? Why don't we just tap into our own experience, our own wisdom, our own, our own um, impulse, or follow our own gut? Why do, we, why do we go to the Lord in prayer? Well, number one, it, it helps us to recognize and be reminded of our dependence upon him, right? I mean, if I say to Pastor Vinny, hey, listen, will you help me with this? What I am ultimately saying is, I can't do this on my own. I need help. And can I tell you, we don't do that very easily, do we? And so when I go to prayer, what I'm doing is I am recognizing my dependence upon the creator of the universe, the one who knows me better than anybody, who loves me more than anybody. And when when I'm praying, I'm recognizing that God, without you, I can do nothing. You're the vine, I'm the branch, and without you, I'm lost. I'm sunk. And so when I am praying, I'm recognizing my utter dependence upon him. They say, well, Christianity is just a crutch. No, it's not. It's a complete stretcher. 
And he carries us. We pray because it reminds us that I don't need to employ my own thoughts, follow my own gut. I need to first recognize God. Tell me, show me what I have to do, what I'm to do. James said, don't boast about tomorrow for tomorrow has enough problems. Nobody's promised tomorrow. And we recognize that, that ultimately God who sees all and knows all, he's the one that we need to look to first. Secondly, we, we pray because we're reminded that we're not at the center of the universe. There's a newsflash. I think sometimes we, we think that everything that's going on is about us. All the challenges, whatever conflict, whatever. listen, we are not, this might hurt to hear, but you're not at the center of God's universe. It's all about Jesus. It's all about his glory. It's all about his honor. It's all about his majesty. He is the creator. We are the creation. We exist to love God and glorify God forever. And we get to, we get to enjoy the blessings of that relationship. But listen, we are not the focus. John 6 tells us that we are a gift from the Father to the Son. Oof. He is the center of all things. We as Christian Americans, we think it's all about us, that we have some kind of, we're like we're entitled to this passionate relationship. No, we're just the beneficiaries of something we don't deserve and have had the opportunity to experience as God's sons and daughters. And when I am praying, I am reminded that it's really not about me. It's about him. It's about his glory and his honor. And then thirdly, we pray because it, it creates an environment where we surrender our will to God's will. I don't know about you, but when, I, when conflict comes my way, I'm very quick to come up with a plan on how to get out of it. It's amazing how quick I can come up with a strategy. I have been able to just employ, just using my own, my own skill set or whatever, very quickly, here's, if this is what happens, here's what I need to do, and I create an environment that I've got it all figured out, and it's all my will. What prayer does, though, when I go to the Lord, I recognize it's not about what I think should happen because I'm very limited in, into what I can possibly see. And so when I am praying, I'm recognizing that my will needs to yield to his will. Jesus, even Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane when, when I mean, there was nothing exciting about going to the cross, by the way. And as he prayed in the garden, he said, Father, if there's any other way, let it be, let, let, if there's any other way possible, Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And prayer makes me take a moment of pause to make sure that I am not employing my will over God's will. And I have been shocked at the amount of times that I had a plan that was not God's plan. We pray because he is the creator and we are the creation. Listen, we don't pray to change things. We pray to change us. God is sovereign over all. He is going to do what he is going to do. And so when we pray, we are changing our will to align it with God's will. It puts us, ultimately, what is prayer doing? It puts us on the same page as God. And as I am praying, there is an intimacy that is built up between me and the lover of my soul. You can't talk to somebody on a regular basis in an intimate way without solidifying and strengthening a relationship. And that's really what prayer is. It's a love language between creator and creation that we express our heart to him. And so we see that the people of God, they responded not to what they had to say. They didn't respond according to what they were feeling on the inside. They responded by going to God and praying. But they didn't just pray. I think what we have here in this, in this passage of scripture, in verse nine, we see a very healthy balance that is presented before us to, to kind of take into consideration. They pray and then they prepare. Look, and we pray to our God first, and we set a guard as a protection against them day and night. 
In other words, they didn't just pray and do nothing. You see, this is for the Christian who says, I just need to pray and sit back and let God do whatever God's going to do. Listen, there's a part where we need to recognize God has given us a responsibility to do things that are within our power to do. And what we see here is they, they recognize the healthy priority. We are going to pray, and then we are going to do whatever we can do with our own resources. We are going to work with whatever we can work with until God delivers us. They pray, and they prepare. I'll be honest and say, I don't know quite when my efforts end and God's kick in. I don't know when that starts and stops. I just know this. I know that, I know that when God has called me to do something, and I, and I bring it to him in prayer, I, am then going, I, I, I then need to employ whatever resources God has placed in my life, and when I recognize that those resources are not enough, at some point along the way, God kicks in. And, I, and here's how I, I, I kind of balance it all out. I kind of look at it like this. I, I, I go forward like it all depends on me. And I sleep at night because I know it all depends on him. I recognize that I can't possibly do it, but I'm going to act like I'm going to do the best I can as if it all depended on me. But I'm going to sleep like a baby knowing that where I fall short, and boy, do I fall short, God is going to accomplish the work in us. We pray and we plan. There's a healthy balance as Christians that we need to employ. We need to recognize that, that faith is, is not a passive word. It is an action word. It, is not, it, it calls you to, to do something and to hold on to God while doing it. And notice they, they did it day and night, it says. And we prayed to our God, and we set a guard as a protection against them when day and night. It wasn't like, hey, let's give a God a try and see if he comes through. No. They prayed, and they prepared, and they watched day and night. It speaks of being intentional. It speaks of consistency. It speaks of following through. It speaks of hard work. It speaks of recognizing that God is going to honor my efforts as, as small as they may be. But coupled with God's ability, it can accomplish great things for God. There are some great lessons for us to learn from the Jews to employ in our daily lives here. There are times when it seems like everything will seem to surround you and appear to be working against you. It may be all around you and make you feel like, is there any way I'm going to get to this next step of growth that God has for me? And it's in those moments that we need to really look past the immediacy of things. We need to recognize that ultimately there's a God in heaven who loves you, who's ordained your birth, who has a purpose for your life. And he's going to carry you through. Listen, God will bring you through circumstances just to show you that he can carry you through them. God will build and play, God will allow mountains to be in your life just to show you that he's bigger than the mountains. God is so committed to our growth and to our understanding of our dependence upon him that he will allow even inconveniences and obstacles in our life so that we can recognize that he is bigger than every one of them and that he is faithful. That's what, Nehemiah, that's what Nehemiah and, 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 and the people of, of, of Jerusalem learned. That no matter what they were saying, no matter who they were surrounded by, no matter what opposition that, was, that was, they were faced with, they continued to build. They continued to grow. They, they continued to depend on each other to depend on God, and they became stronger in their commitment to what God had called them to do. And what's true for them is true for you and me. If we will just continue to look to him, who was able to do exceedingly abundantly above whatever we can ask or think, he who is the perfect parent, if our loving father would allow opposition into your life. It is always for a purpose. And he will carry you through it. And he will hold you tight. 
and you will come out better on the other side. That's what they learned in, 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 when they were building the wall. And as, if we look to him, as we look to him, we will learn the same truth in our daily lives. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you that in the greatest scheme of things about bringing about your glory, you also invite us to be a part of the plan. Uh, what a joy it is to be the children of God. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters, anyone that may be here today that, that feels surrounded by opposition. That no matter where they look, they're reminded of obstacles. May they see you as bigger than that which is approaching, that is opposing them. May they hold closer to you than they ever have before. May they grow through this in ways that bring glory and honor to your name. Lord, help us to bask in your caring love for us. Help us to be reminded of your faithful and tender care of us so that when things come our way, we don't freak out wondering what happened. We can recognize that if you're letting a trial in, you're going to carry us through it and you're going to grow us along the way. Lord, thank you for your word. It truly is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you for how it speaks to us in today in a way as if it was just written. God, we just ask that you continue to open the eyes of our understanding to the word of God so that we might see you bigger and love you more. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.